that the curls of hair upon the fallen angel's head could almost be horns. Now, do you still want to know what's going on? Yes. Isn't it obvious, Dream King? No. I've quit. You've... I'm sorry. What was that? Honestly, Morpheus, you need not stare at us with that ridiculous expression on your face. I do not understand. No. I've stopped. I've resigned. I'm leaving. I am no king, Morpheus. Not anymore. We're the only entities left in hell, Morpheus. I was the first one here. And it looks like I'm going to be the last. It's over. I am leaving. And I have closed down hell. Ten billion years I've spent in this place. That's a long time. And we've all changed since the beginning. You can forget the honorifics. Rank never mattered to me, not really. But the demons expected it. Which is one reason I've quit. I'm tired, Morpheus. You knew me, Dream. You knew me when I was an angel. What was I like? You were very proud, Samael. But you were also very beautiful. And wise. And passionate. Was I? I cared about so many things. I cared so deeply back then. The beginning of things. In the Silver City. He remembers being an angel, beautiful, holding a flaming sword, staring up at the face of God defiantly. I suppose that was why everything began to go wrong. You know, I still wonder how much of it was planned, how much of it he knew in advance. I thought I was rebelling. I thought I was defying his rule. No. I was merely fulfilling another tiny segment of his great and powerful plan. In Lucifer's memory, the fall from heaven is a long, tumbling descent through endless dark, his wings shredding. We fell, my comrades in arms and I. We fell so far. So long. From Neil Gaiman's Seasons of the Mist collection in The Sandman. Perfectly appropriate for this show's theme. A special show, a devil double header. And appropriate for Aeon Bites ethos, as you shall see. In Seasons of the Mist, Lucifer finally has his gnosis knows he himself was caught in a devil's bargain. He was trapped by both his demiurgic ego and the demiurge himself, and suddenly understood that all along he could change his story and reach his potential. He knew, like the Gnostics of old, that cosmic freedom was all that matters, that he needed to choose ecstasy over entertainment that he needed to integrate his past with his own lost soul. Thus, he quit being the Lord of Hell. He walked away from the empire that never ended. There are very few things that I will defend with true passion. Medical marijuana, the biblical Satan as a metaphor for rebellion against tyranny, and motherfucking goddamn cryptocurrency. That's a lesson we need to embrace, we shining crazy diamonds. To fight the Empire is to be infected by its derangement. As Philip K. Dick wrote in Vallis, and that exactly was Satan's tragic mistake. That's the mistake of so many meat sacks today. Sir, are you classified as human? Uh, Negative. I am a meat popsicle. These words by Arundhati Roy evince what we need to do. Our strategy should be not only to confront empire, but to lay siege to it, to deprive it of oxygen, to shame it, to mock it. With our art, our music, our literature, our stubbornness, our joy, our brilliance, our sheer relentlessness and our ability to tell our own stories. Stories that are different from the ones we're being brainwashed to believe. 
Advertising has us chasing cars and clothes. Working jobs we hate, so we can buy shit we don't need. Human beings were not meant to sit in little cubicles staring at computer screens all day, filling out useless forms and listening to eight different bosses drone on about mission statements. Just like Lucifer, who in The Sandman later becomes a musician, a bar owner, a passerby like the Gospel of Thomas urges everyone in the Black Iron Prison to be. And yes, then some Archons made a shitty TV show based on this character. And yes, Gaiman himself has sold out to the Archons, sadly becoming another cog in the Empire that never ended. That's what the Matrix does. It weaponizes every idea, every dream, everything that's important to us. But not us, for we are of the broken places, and we chill with the god in the gutter, with that despised philosopher's stone buried in the mud. We've been through so many open infernos and ridden the coils of the Ouroboros for so many existences. More than those 10 billion years, Lucifer stayed in his thankless managerial job in hell. Did you see the memo about this? But as Oscar Wilde said, We are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at stars. And as Gaiman said, this time in Stardust, and Lawrence quoted in his Astronosis presentation, a philosopher once asked, Are we human because we gaze at the stars? Or do we gaze at them because we are human? Pointless, really. Do the stars gaze back? Now that's a question. It's like we've forgotten who we are, Tom. Explorers, pioneers, not caretakers. Well, we used to look up in the sky and wonder at our place in the stars. Now we just look down and worry about our place in the dirt. Lucifer asked that question in a way. You know the answer as together we lay siege to and starve the Empire. By the power of truth, I, while living, have conquered the universe. Personal motto? From Faust. That's about trying to cheat the devil, isn't it? So let's get to that devil doubleheader, you modern-day Tom Sawyers. Your mind not for rent to any god or government. Let's give the devil his due with two fantastic astral guests. First, we'll speak to Carl Abrahamson about his new book, Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan. Get ready for an understanding of modern light bringing and that, like many ancient Gnostic groups that dressed as animals or archons or aeons in their rituals, Sometimes you gotta fake it until you make it, and cosplay yourself into individuation. It's that Nietzschean vibe of creating an aesthetic that frees you to go through the abyss and onto the rainbow bridge. Always part of writing your own gospel and living your own myth. So be wise, because the world needs more wisdom. And if you cannot be wise, pretend to be someone who is wise and then just behave like they would. And now go and make interesting mistakes, make amazing mistakes, make glorious and fantastic mistakes, break rules, leave the world more interesting for your being here, make good art. Then we'll speak to Matt Frederick on his new book, A Meeting at the Crossroads, Robert Johnson and the Devil. Get ready for African-American folklore and gnosis, Faustian bargains in pop music, and the greatest devil of them all, the trickster. Yes, Hermes and Sophia are above Lucifer and even the supreme being of this universe. They are the cosmic shit-posting, John Keel, intra-dimensional jokers that can break our sanities, but also provide the means to starve, mock, and ultimately defeat the Empire. They are the stars gazing back at us. 
No one here gets out alive, but we can live forever in pure freedom, my beloved true seekers. We can. This place is designed to mess you up, to mess with your head. None of this is real. It's all just trials to test your heroic attributes. Hmm. Indeed, two amazing astral guests and a labyrinth of devilish topics. As I say often, Gnosis makes us all fallen angels. And as I say now, time to fully close your inner hells. You're still saying she's in hell. Everybody's hell is different. It's not all fire and pain. The real hell is your life gone wrong. Never forget, we are all legion. Many more and so much more talented and intelligent than Yaldi Baldi and his catamites in the establishment. Maybe part of defeating the Empire will be like the ending of Finding Nemo. Us the fish, united and determined, pulling against the net of the Archons and crashing down the boat of civilization until we are released into the oceans of potential. We gotta do it, and we gotta do it now. As Adyashanti wrote, Anything you avoid in life will come back over and over again until you're willing to face it, to look deeply into its true nature. Nothing in this world is easy except pissing in the shower. And as Laurel Canyon program Joni Mitchell sang, We are stardust, billion-year-old carbon. We are golden, caught in the devil's bargain. And we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. Even you, Lucifer. You have gnosis now, and it's time to rise into the heavens of your art, passion, and imagination. No longer a cog in the wheel of samsara getting off the coils of the Ouroboros. Or maybe I'm wrong and it's all like Tom Waits saying, there ain't no devil, only God when he's drunk. Our Father, which art in heaven, stay there. And we shall stay on earth, which is sometimes so pretty. Regardless, we can all walk away from the Empire, create our own narrative and aesthetic and ecstasy. You know this in your heart, for you have the heart of a light bringer. You are amazing, and it's time to stop denying your potential. As the country music saying goes, you didn't come this far just to come this far. You aim to cheat the devil. Human offering. Thank you so much for all your support, your company, your feedback. You make Aeon Bite shine like the morning star in these Gnostic times, Philip K. Dick world and age of Hermes. I, Miguel Connor, your pompadus of Gnosis, am honored to be in your company here in the desert of the real with the god in the gutter and that despised philosopher's stone. Gaze back, stars. Gaze back at us. How are you supposed to relate to a friend whose life is directed from beyond the stars? I mean, what, what kind of attitude am I supposed to take to that? Let us to our devil doubleheader with Carl Abrahamson and Matt Frederick. And let us hear some more of Sophia from Lucifer in... Seasons of the Mist. And I knew then that there was no way that I would ever return to paradise. But I grew weary, dreamed not. I ceased to care. And the mortals, oh, I ask you, why? Tell me that, why? Why what, first among the fallen? Why do they blame me for all their little failings? They use my name as if I spend my entire day sitting on their shoulders, forcing them to commit acts they would otherwise find repulsive. Oh, the devil made me do it. I've never made one of them do anything. Never. They live their own tiny lives. I do not live their lives for them. 
And then they die and they come here, having transgressed against what they believe to be right, and expect us to fulfill their desire for pain and retribution. I don't make them come here. They talk of me going around and buying souls like a fishwife come market day, never stopping to ask themselves why. I need no souls. And how can anyone own a soul? No, they belong to themselves. They just hate to have to face up to it. Yes, I rebel. It was a long time ago. How long was I meant to pay for that one action? So now it's over. I have sent all of them away. All of Hell's inhabitants. Where have you sent them? Away, I don't care where they've gone. Heaven, Earth, Limbo, the Far Realms, who knows? But they won't be coming here anymore. Hell is over. This is the Aeon Bite interview. And with us, we have the pleasure of being joined by Carl Abrahamson to discuss his new book, Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan, Infernal Wisdom from the Devil's Den. Carl, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure is all ours. And as I mentioned, really enjoyed your book, opened up a lot of dimensions and uh, offered some useful insights in my life. And with us, too, we've got the Moondog Vans. Vans, how are you doing? I'm good. Looking forward uh, to a devil of a good time, as Carl tells his tale. So hopefully I won't horn in too much. <laughs> <laughs> the list of puns has to, has to be ticked off. Got to do it. <laughs> <You> Got to <laughs> do it. <laughs> so, Carl, um, why don't we just go over the book? There's so much uh, good stuff and talk about the structure of the book. But uh, tell us briefly how you gravitated to Anton LaVey and became engaged in his philosophy. I believe it was, what, back in 1989? Yeah. Uh, the gravitation, I think, was, was uh, slightly earlier than that. And we have to go back to almost uh, early 80s, you know, when I was about, uh, well, I was a teenager, basically, and looking for... Uh, cool things through which I could individuate, you know, provocative and, you know, controversial. And there was a lot of good things going on in music at the time. And I, I was interested in um, the occult and, you know, kinds of radical things. And wherever you looked, you know, you, you couldn't really miss Anton LaVey. He was there because of the fact that uh, he was present still in the media. And in my case, I got to see it through Swedish men's magazines who still ran these sort of kitschy sensationalist um, uh, spreads of pictures of the nude ladies on the altar, et cetera, et cetera. But then, of course, you had the Satanic Bible, which was and still is, you know, kind of a bestseller. It's never gone out of print. So I got that when I started collecting and reading occult stuff. And I, I felt immediately kind of resonance with that because it was new, innovative, modern in a way. It wasn't dusty or too arcane. And, and uh, I just liked it very much. So... Uh, it, that was established early on, like in my teenage years. And then I, used, I, I call it usually a, like a parallel strain is my love of American trash culture, you know, B-movies, <laughs> horror films, uh, peroxide blondes with big uh, bosoms. And my favorite was always Jane Mansfield, you know, oh, yeah. and, and uh, she had that much I understood or, or um, uh, read somewhere, you know, that they, she had had a, a fling with Anton LaVey, you know, they had been together, they, they used each other for sure, for PR purposes, there was always like great uh, magic or chemistry when they were together and the paparazzi loved it, you know, but they, they actually knew each other and, and LaVey claimed that she was, uh, as he said, a card carrying member of the Church of Satan, and she said that uh, she liked the philosophy and stuff, but she wasn't really too involved, but anyway, I, my love for her and for other similar movie stars and my admiration of LaVey as this cool, also innovative, uh, magical person it sort of created a, a meltdown in my teenage mind, my late teenage mind. And that led to me writing a song together with my band at the time uh, called White Stains. And the song was called Sweet Jane, just like the Lou Reed song. And basically, that was a... Um, uh, tribute song to LaVey, to Mansfield, and to the relationship they had. And at the same time, I was active in, um, in the occult. I was involved with some groups, one of which was the Temple of Psychic Youth, which was basically an, an, uh, a British uh, organization. Um, and one of the key people there, Genesis Peoridge, he said when that record came out, 
that I should really send it to Lave because I think um, he thought that he Lave would appreciate it. So I did, not expecting anything. But then I got a letter back from Anton Lave saying that he appreciated the initiative and that Jane would be happy, and and it was a very very nice, generous letter in which he also made me a member of the Church of Satan. That was oh, kind of his cool. shtick, yeah. shtick at the time, you know. If he liked someone, he just handed them <laughs> a membership card. <laughs> uh, and uh, so basically, from there on, I was completely, you know, beyond fanboy. I was, uh, you know, awestruck, and, and my mind was completely blown. And we kept in touch in correspondence, and uh, he let me use... Um, some of his writing for the journal that I had just started called the Fenris Wolf, which is still active today, is kind of this uh, occultural journal. Uh, so he was very, you know, accommodating and friendly. And we agreed that, you know, whenever uh, I would come to to San Francisco, I was welcome to visit, you know, and of course, I wanted that uh, so much. So I worked and I saved up money and just um, uh, focused on that and then in 1989 was my first trip over uh, when I met him and Blanche Barton and we hung out and had wonderful times uh, about which I write uh, in the book concerning hanging out and also the, the movie aspects and we watched a lot of movies and the musical aspects and things like that and then it sort of carried on almost every year up until 1993 where that was the last time I, I met him and then he died in 97 so my gravitation was one that went from being like an awestruck student in a way in part of uh, occultism, but in part also of American, uh, a certain kind of American culture. And these gelled, they, these kind of strains merged in my mind. And then it became like a magical reality for me that became like an objective reality for me also. So that's the short, short version. <laughs> Very cool. And thanks for sharing. Yeah. And he also, uh, Lave also officiated your wedding too. That's awesome. Yeah, that's right. That was uh, not on the first trip, but on the next one, I believe, um, I had brought my uh, girlfriend and I just wondered, I, I knew that they weren't involved in that kind of thing anymore where they like officiated things. Uh, he was basically uh, not a recluse, but he was reclusive. You know, he, he liked to stay in the house. He felt safe and, you know, inviting friends over and just uh, enjoying life, basically, and not being as extroverted as he had been in the 60s and in the 70s. Um, and um, I was very happy when I asked him, we asked him, and uh, he agreed to to marry us in, in their old um, ritual chamber of the Black House. So that was that was very fascinating. Yeah, it's very cool. There's one story that struck out to me if you wanted to share with the audience, but uh, you went to visit him, you guys went to a restaurant, you just wanted to have a nice meal. And there were some people next to you all coked up, they were being really loud and uh, Leve did something, didn't he, to... Uh, get to quieten them or get them away yeah yeah he he certainly did on the inside there was there was no brawl or anything like that but i could sense <laughs> that he i could sense that he was incensed as you say he was really angry about it because it was kind of a small uh, space great food wonderful it was me and him and uh, blash barton and uh, it was just these guys, I, I don't, uh, back then, I don't think there were things like tech bros, you know, but they were sort of similar in the way, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> completely arrogant and definitely coked up and just so uh, rude and obnoxious. And I think they were sort of making fun of, because Lave was always uh, flamboyant, even when he was dressing down, he was just, he had great style, panache, but he sort of belonged more in the late 40s than he did in the, the late 90s, uh, the late um, 80s, early 90s. So in that sense, nothing really happened. But what it was remarkable that they just uh, tossed some cash on the table and left. And nothing had been said from Lave's side or from Blanche Barton's side. There was just this, this uh, I would call it, you know, magical, magical bad vibes from, the, from them. And from me too, I assume, I hope, uh, that just made <laughs> these guys go up and leave. Yeah, and back then he, was, he didn't have his Ming the Conqueror look. It was something uh, not really. He, he had the same, you know, hairdo and the same uh, beard style and stuff. But he, he looked more like a, an eccentric uh, grandpa in a way. Uh, very, very stylish. Uh, always some uh, great extra flair um, but and I, I think some restaurants in San Francisco they knew him all along all through his life you know um, 
uh, Easy Steakhouse. It's a wonderful place. And they still, I was there a couple of years ago, and they still have pictures of him on the wall. You know, so he was, you know, well-known San Francisco character, but this particular restaurant that we, that was more like a newly opened sort of kind of fancy Fran French style restaurant. And they, um, they obviously didn't know because then some waiter would have come and just like told these guys to <laughs> go away, but we managed anyway to make them go away. Awesome. And uh, in your book, Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan, uh, so we understand LaVey and his contribution. You write, uh, he is a pop Nietzschean. What do you mean by that, Carl? Yeah, I, 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 um, being a pop Nietzsche is like uh, distilling and filtering and letting sort of the wisdom and sort of gemstones of, of Nietzsche sort of trickle down through a controversial filter or matrix that was um, the, uh, that was the uh, Church of Satan. And it's sometimes it's easier, you know, if people talk about Nietzsche, you know, you have this almost programmed uh, reactions that people get, you know, he was this, he was all bad, whatever. But the more, more and more you read Nietzsche yourself, you realize that he was just like one of the first, uh, I don't know what you call it, like almost like self-help, self-help people. Right. You know, it's all about overcoming your own weaknesses. And then, of course, he had a great disdain for what he called the slave moralities and, and particularly in particular um, uh, Christianity. And that of course was something that LaVey could uh, relate to and, and sort of, uh, uh, you know, just uh, keep working with that same kind of energy and discourse in a way. So uh, what I mean by that is that he took Nietzschean concepts and Nietzschean ideas that sometimes is kind of lofty and highbrow and, you know, uh, what do you call it, highfalutin, and LaVey sort of translated it, sometimes ad verbatim, quoting him uh, directly, uh, but on the whole, I think he re-expressed what Nietzsche wanted to say in a very um, contemporary language that I think really hit home, because this was a time, you know, we, that we all know was like this strange mixture between, uh, and if we focus on San Francisco in particular, you know, had the, the flower children on one hand, you were completely high, um and happy i'm sure i hope <laughs> and, and just knows? you know free free love and you know um then on the other hand you had the, the vietnam war and these sort of uh, evangelical christians and these very very conservative tendencies and he was sort of stuck in between there being as radical uh, for the hippies as he was uh, for the you know the squares or the conservatives they didn't like the satan aspect whereas they could maybe appreciate some of his philosophy and the flower children thought he was just like you know why why be evil all these cliches um and and certainly not adhering to his sense of law and order for instance and also sobriety and being clear and being you know just uh, uh, a thorough worker in the process of making your life uh, really tangibly good in a kind of Epicurean way. Uh, enjoyment and pleasure of all kinds, but not so that you numb your mind with drugs or booze or anything like that. It's just like a very, his philosophy was uh, one of pleasure and uh, certainly life affirming and life enhancing, but not about uh, getting wasted or getting so high you, you don't know what you're doing. And on the other hand, he was pro you know, law and order, but not in any kind of draconian sense that the the uh, extreme, um, you know, members of the Republican Party or these sort of really hell-bent uh, warmongers were at the time. He was sort of in between, and he actually had that as a concept later on. He called it the third side or the third, you know, alternative in a way. It's a very satanic standpoint when you're in the middle of something and you can watch all directions and also evaluate that's the position of the uh, evaluator and also in a way like um, the etymological meaning of the word satan you know the accuser the adversary and to be in the center of things that's, that's a very good satanic position oh well said yes that's definitely very niche and especially the idea of uh creating your own aesthetic to deal with the world and to handle going staring into the abyss and that's what i think one of the central points of your book and also satanism as uh, you write the concept of the psychodrama of ritual mm -hmm. and uh i know you go freudian or levey went freudian but 
I see it as more Jungian, where Jung said we have to have the right mass, the right persona to be able to deal with reality and to be able to allow our consciousness to to come out. And uh, I even uh, the tagline of the show is uh, for a young bite is write your own gospel, live your own myth, mm-hmm. which is kind of mm-hmm. like that. And one mistake people think or have is that they think that the ancients sat around reading the Bible or pagan literature or the Torah, and they sat around in a group. But the truth is that religion was always meant to be performed. They would perform Mm -hmm. and get dressed and like the mystery religions and not just perform it, but get really engaged into it. It was therapeutic. It was cathartic. You became the gods and the God became you. And you walked out with solutions, not just to the, answers of the cosmos but solutions to your life you you yeah. lost your fear of death you felt happier in your married life and i think levey really kind of recaptured what had been lost in religion and humanity mm, absolutely and there you have again a very very uh Nietzsche as a, uh, as a midpoint in a way from the from the ancient times and sort of the late 19th century where he tried to reformulate and he was of course was a classicist you know he really enjoyed uh, <laughs> antiquity as it's called and also the, the pagan goings on there's in particular the Dionysian ones and I'm thinking when you said that of, of Crowley as Crowley as also kind of a midpoint person because he said uh, of course that you know there is no god but man and and the LaVey included that also in his own formulation but you know you are your own god and that kind of it's like a theme of um, the 20th century in a way because um, uh, for good and bad you know the good thing is this self-empowering thing and sort of getting rid of this yoke of perhaps you've grown up in a monotheist religion or at least a monotheist monotheist uh, culture and all of those uh, neuroses that come with that baggage um so the good thing about the, this kind of philosophy from a self-empowering point of view is that you divest yourself of all of that and you realize it's my responsibility it's me it's up to me the successes are mine the failures are mine i cannot blame anyone else it's up to me to fix this and then on the other hand, what I meant by, by uh, for good and bad, the bad things could be seen as uh, like I'm thinking of the 1980s in particular, again, you know, with these coked up people, uh, stockbrokers and, and uh, these kind of business people who become... Um, Uh, egotists in overdrive they become so arrogant and so um i don't know uh, almost i wouldn't say self-effacing but they certainly efface other people uh, carelessly and without consideration of the impact that that can have also on them meaning it's a short-sighted egotism i think lave was very much in favor of egotism but perhaps something that you could call an altruistic egotism where when you're focusing on your life and what's good for you, you will inspire other people to do the inherent altruism in the uh, um, in the system, so to speak. No, really, yeah, well said. We definitely need that uh, third position or that third uh, place to be able to mm-hmm. see, like Janice, to see all sides, and again, find yeah. our own aesthetic and our own. Uh, to create our own art for our own soul. I think yeah. that's, uh, that's so important. Um, and what would you, you also write too, Carl, that uh, LaVey is the, is the major um, contributor to modern magical philosophy. And obviously he was innovative, he was psychological. What other contributions or how did he do it? Uh, I think that, that there's, there are many, many what what you just said and and what i think about uh, most often when i think about sort of him being a, what i call a magical innovator it's this thing where it's not the concepts in themselves they're they're fantastic and they're really innovative and they're you know i can't stress this enough that they are they were new they, they're still new but what made him so special was in his 
modernity in a way, uh, he called things from what had inspired him. And what was it that had inspired him? It was culture. He was so immersed in movies. He was so immersed in music. He was so immersed in lore of these forgotten, you know, literally occult writers and, and filmmakers. And, and uh, he valued this, meaning the inspiration that they had given him as a teenager, as a young man, as an adult man, he valued it so much that he integrated those things in his own uh, lore, in his own mythology in a way. And that's remarkable because uh, when you look back at, let's call it recent magical history, you have the old school, what Crowley called old eon you know these fraternal hierarchical uh, structures you know like of a freemasonic kind uh, with different kinds of teaching but it was still the same structure and it's still cloaked in a mystery um, and a, a journey of initiation steeped in symbolism coming from some vague romanticized uh, antiquity that that's one thing and then you had um uh, post Crowley, sort of almost like uh, with the equivalent of punk rock, uh, these new things like the Temple of Psychic Youth and the Chaos Magic that sort of toppled everything in a kind of an anarchic and artistic way and uh, became, you know, totally pragmatic. It was based in uh, everyday life and and in, in integrate everything. And you had more perhaps um, a psychological uh, awareness uh, of these things. But Lavey was he kept to the romance, but the romance wasn't something that he had gotten from someone else older. It was his own romance, his own mythology. And it was all based on what you today would call uh, cultural memes. It could be a song that he had heard in 1948. It could be a movie that he had watched in 1952. And they became so important to him that he could validate and value them um, much decades later and integrate them in his own ritual. For instance, performing a ritual by playing that tune in a special kind of emotional uh, mind frame in a way, thereby uh, using that composition and the sounds and you know the theory of the butterfly effect etc to blast out his will or whatever it is uh, whatever it was that he wanted to achieve um, that kind of i don't know per, let's call it personal meme magic in a way orchestrated through a highly highly personalized overall aesthetic that was completely new uh, at least i <laughs> i didn't know at the time and i still don't know that anyone else was doing something similar at the time. And it wasn't only him alone in his reclusive years. It was also happening uh, in the Church of Satan's most active and extroverted days, and also before that in his group that he had called the Magic Circle, um, which was basically the early 60s up until the formation of the Church of Satan. And even there, he wove in things and the strains and energies from uh, from fiction, for instance, the Lovecraftian, the pulp, pulp magazines, uh, the cos early cosmic horror stories were woven into the theatrics, in a way, of the Church of Satan, as was the aesthetic of film noir, as was the aesthetic and content of many of the German expressionists uh, and horror films from the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, and that's, that was like unheard of, you know, creating a completely new aesthetic, a new methodology, a new uh, way of working magic, basically. It was, uh, I still find it uh, very, very fascinating. And I mean, there's so much to research there for anyone who wants to jump into that rabbit hole. Uh, but yeah, so I think he was uh, um, timeless in a way, but he was also in comparison, very, very modern. Yeah, I, there's one section, Carl, and uh, uh, you have, uh, for the audience, there's a, a section where uh, there's interviews with different individuals talking about Anton LaVey, but one of them with our mutual friend, Mitch Horowitz, mm -hmm. and I think he nails it on the head because he says LaVey was a cult, but he still really doesn't fit into a cultism. He's really unique. He doesn't really fit anywhere. He really is in the third way, in the middle of everything. 
Yeah, absolutely. No, that, that's uh, very, very uh, well put. And I think um, to a degree it comes from um, him having worked at uh, some circuses and sideshows. And, you know, he usually gets the derogatory term, oh, he was just a showman, as if that's something yeah. to be <laughs> discounted. But what I think he learned there was not only like uh, tricks and, and um, you know, cold reading of people and taking advantage of that. I think also he realized how um, people want to be fooled in a way. And then in his own like real, genuine occult researches um, and studies and things like that, and also communicating with other people on a similar kind of path at the time, he realized that these people also want to be fooled. They want to have this mystical quagmire of terminology, symbology, all these things, simply because they don't want to move ahead. They don't want any serious transformation. They want to be in this particular forest uh, in which you can't see anything, any kind of truth, because it's you, you're, uh, uh, there's simply so many sim symbols around you and so many teachers that will sell you um, some kind of teaching that won't change your life. And he, I think he realized early on that um, from his experiences at the sideshow that people are willing to pay for uh, for this kind of experience and whether that's some elaborate sort of masochism or maybe it's just that they people most people take one step towards something but they get very comfortable in having taken the step and then forget to move on that life is a process that life is a path that you know transformation is not a one time happening it's a process um so i think that his evaluation of the occult scene or the occult market at the time uh, didn't really give him much uh, faith or hope or or uh you know, uh, he he didn't see a lot of value there, and I think there's a point in uh, in the film that I made, which the book is sort of based on the same material. It's a wonderful scene where he he talks about this thing that is sort of struck up uh, like a deal with a uh, with the demons. Of course, he means that symbolically, not like in some kind of Faustian uh, way. But you have to befriend the forces that you want to work with specifically if you want them to give you something meaning there needs to be a communication that's um, uh, reciprocal in a way whereas most of the uh, again old aeonic magic it's just like one hubristic magician who stands with right. his or her uh, <laughs> magical weapons demanding things from these forces you know without really wanting to give anything back it's a one-sided economy it's a credit economy and that's usually i think in our western mythology why these um, <laughs> sorcerers of sorts uh, usually end up badly and i'm thinking specifically if you remember in fantasia you know the source yeah. sorcerer's <laughs> apprentice with mickey mouse sort of the, the sorcerer goes away and Mickey thinks that he's a magician and he just commands these forces in order to, you know, get more brooms to sweep the floor, but it ends in disaster. You know, and I think LaVey realized that that early on, you have to be on the side of the forces uh, with which you want to communicate and have an interaction and, and possibly a transaction. Really well said. And yes, uh, what you just said, Carl, reminds me of a quote. It was my favorite, probably my favorite quote of the book. And it's towards the back where you have a section with uh, LaVey's quote. And he says, uh, the public loves to be fooled. And secondly, they'll pay any price for an identity. If by being fooled, they will gain an identity, they would rather be fooled. I think that's brilliant and so yeah, relevant yeah. to today. We want people yeah. to program us a story, everything, instead of, again, finding our own aesthetic, our own yeah. art, our own entertainment, our own mask to enjoy mm -hmm. life. Yeah, absolutely. No, it, 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 in so many ways, he has been so uh, prescient. You know, if we talk about this concept of artificial human companions, that was something that he got off on, you know, constructing his own, um, uh, humanoids in a way, uh, using uh, store mannequins, rebuilding them, designing them, hanging out with them, talking to them, uh, which is kind of this sort of, what do you call it, uh, Galatea, you know, create your own love object in a way. Um, he liked that. And then he so got so much into it, uh, sensing that other people uh, found it so interesting also that they also started. And he, he predicted um, a time 
when that would be a huge business. And as with many things in technology, it's driven, you know, the internet, whatever, um, it's driven by uh, sexual urges and pornography. That was has been true also with these uh, uh, very lifelike dolls. You know, there's a company called Real Doll and several others who make, well, basically uh, sex toy dolls. But they are so lifelike that you could just as well <laughs> not have sex with them right. and, you know, dress them up instead and have them as uh, conversation partners. That's what he was into, sort of creating scenes in which he could communicate with, you know, could be bygone days or, or maybe something from the future. Basically creating your own scenario, not with people that he found uh, disturbing or uh, you know demanding too much but with his own people people that he had created given personalities uh, styled them etc cetera, etc cetera. and i think that's right and and uh, i also mentioned one thing in uh, in the book uh, while writing the book and working on the film and later the book i saw this um, documentary by uh, Werner Herzog, the B Bavarian filmmaker. And he had been in Japan and uh, made a documentary about people. Actually, there are these hotels that are called Android hotels where you can check in and talk to androids and these, these sort of humanoid dolls. And then um, um, Herzog said that this is really going to be like a mass market thing uh, because it's already so big in big in Japan. And then that then it dawned on me, wow, Lave was so prescient when it comes to these things. It's taken a couple of decades, but now it's a reality. Basically, when something goes from prurient pornographical sexual to something that is more mainstream and um, existential basically um, I, I think he I think he was right and and we just have to wait and see but um, um, there are other things also um, he talked about um, the total environment it was also kind of a new concept at the time where it was not only recommended but absolutely um, he, he strongly recommended that you work with that, even if it's only a corner of your room, or if you can spare one room, or maybe even a whole house, if, you, if you're so uh, lucky, to design it in order to create, become like a repository of inspirational energy and vitalizing energy um, with things, with music, with how you light the room, uh, other objects you have in it. Um, not simply making a cozy home or a cozy room uh, or nice or something that aesthetically pleasing, but rather something that is ritually charged by your investment of these uh, things in a particular space uh, that will be vitalizing for you. I, I've tried that uh, many times and still do continually. And it is fascinating how much power of energy there is just by moving something uh, from one side of the room to another. I guess that's called, you could call it like satanic feng shui in a way. Um, but on the other hand, uh, we also know that uh, rearranging books in a bookshelf can also be, be very, very interesting. That is, if you love books and have an, like an, an interaction with books. Uh, so I think that um, there are many other things also. So he was a thinking magician. He thought about things. He experimented with things. And he also wrote about things. And th those essays where he writes about these things, they're usually coming late in life. And they are gathered together in two anthologies, one called The Devil's Notebook, from 92, and then this one called Satan Speaks, which is from uh, 97, it came out, in uh, 98, it came out one year after he had died. And they're very humoristic. They're witty, punny, uh, but also very, very full of signal, mag magical signal. They make you think, they make you inspired to try things out. And um, yeah, I think he was a master in, in many respects. And one of the main respects is that he was a thinking magician. He, he worked on these things. Nothing was haphazard, nothing was flimsy, or you know, demanding kudos in the moment. All of it was thought through and worked through, and that's uh, that's really how you uh, create a legacy. I think he didn't really re believe in Satan, though, did he? As an actual entity or being, or whatever. Since he didn't believe in in a anthropomorphic god, no. 
No, not not at all. Uh, and he said that already from the beginning, as that you know where that comes from. It's sort of uh, I don't know weird neuroses and and often psychoses in uh, monotheist uh, history and and particular Christian ones from from medieval times, basically when they the church had become so powerful in a way uh, we all know that power corrupts you want to retain power you don't want to lose power so the structure in itself needed something to control the you know the normal people the serfs basically so that they would continue to pay their church taxes and breed and create more um, taxpayers uh, and then what happened then was that if people can't listen to reason, because most normal people at that time, they were still pretty pagan, you know, in their behavior, rooted in nature, uh, understanding the cycles of nature, and perhaps living in a, you know, particular cultural mythology that um, kept those things alive, then then what do you do? Well, wherever you are on the uh, on the planet, you sort of, Christianity comes and takes over, and then you sort of let some basic things remain so that there won't be total rebellion, but you clothe it in different disguises. And this devil figure was, of course, some kind of, you know, fawn, you know, this pan uh, figure of uh, satyr, uh, that worked for the fertility and the lust of, of uh, society. And then they turned that into some sort of um, anthropomorphic beast, basically, that was just simply rapacious, simply symbolic of evil, whatever that means. Um, and LaVey said that, you know, it's, uh, acknowledge it culturally, but that's not what he was after, nor the Church of Satan. They were after... Uh, I guess you could call it uh, part Nietzsche in terms of philosophy, very much uh, Epicurean, stressing this kind of life enhancement, pleasure, uh, the pleasures, pleasures of the flesh, sensuality, uh, admiring animals because we are but animals, but in the best way. Um, uh, feral, yes, but also capable of being very uh, true to ourselves and our, our feral nature, our animal nature. And then other things too, there was of course the magical uh, aspect to it. He acknowledged uh, magic, but I suspect he found it to be, in one hand, connected to some kind of dark force in nature, but also very much psychological. Uh, like Miguel said, um, quoting from the book, you know, he was a self-professed Freudian. He liked Wilhelm Reich and, of course, Jung. So he was aware of these things and how it worked and that magic must also be uh, something that's so ingrained in our psychology that it could perhaps solely be rooted in psychology. It might not even have to do with anything external. But that's speculation right now in our, our uh, scientific history. So, but the answer is, is no, there was no belief in any kind of anthropomorphic beast or demon or the devil. That's, that's all um, Christian nightmare stuff that was created <laughs> by psychotic people, you know, to scare other people. Yeah, so uh, do you say, though, that Anton LaVey was uh, uh, solipsistic or narcissistic, I mean, concentrating on his own um, satiation of pleasure, whatever? Uh, yeah, but yeah, I think so. But but not in any way in a, in a bad sense. I mean, there, there's negative narcissism for sure when you become so uh, self-aggrandizing that you see no one else. Therefore you forget that man, uh, like LaVey actually said, man is a social animal. We all need to interact and be sort of, I don't know, susceptible to the demands of others uh, to a certain degree because we need them. Uh, but he was certainly an egotist and the egotism uh, I nowadays call the, the satanic version, this altruistic egotism, meaning, like I said before, you can inspire people by being very true to yourself. Narcissism is, is a complicated thing. You have, you know, violent, super negative narcissism of tyrants, for instance. That's exactly the reason why we're having war on European soil again. Um, it's just one person who is narcissistic to to <laughs> to a degree that's very dangerous. And I think you've you've had a taste of that also in the US during the most recent years. Um, however, I don't think LaVey was a narcissist. I think he was a, a healthy egotist, but he was very, very much down to earth. He knew what people he had around him. He knew how the world worked. 
to a great degree. I think that his sense of misanthropy increased over the years simply because you know, that's what happens when you get old. I, you either come to terms with it and sort of resign to the fact that people are idiots or you stay <laughs> angry that people are idiots. And I think yeah, I could sense in him that he was very much a misanthrope. Um, but uh, as Blanche, uh, his partner and mother of his son, also says in the film and also in the book, is that he must have been an idealist. He must have nurtured idealism because otherwise he would never have done all the things that he did, meaning he wasn't solely, you know, pleasure seeking. He wasn't solely uh, self gratifying in that kind of narcissistic vein and wanting everybody to stand on tiptoe and serve him. Uh, he was a very generous and warm uh, person. Um, and he, he uh, dedicated his life uh, not to the philosophy as such, he could have retained it for himself, but he shared it. He shared it with his writing by the creation of the Church of Satan, by being on endless TV shows and, and you know media, and then trying to explain over and over and over again what things mean. Um, and uh, I don't think he would have done that if he had been like a cold-hearted, uh, narcissistic uh, uh, monster in a way. He wasn't. He 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 was uh, he liked what he had found, and he was very very willing and and uh, happy to share it. What does his daughter have to say about it, though? I know his daughter wasn't too happy with him. Well, I think uh, I, I I I I wasn't there. You know, I could never know. But uh, she distanced herself from. Uh, him also in the late 80s that was the the there's an older daughter and then a younger daughter and then much later came a son and um, i don't know the reason for that she was for a time uh, a spokesperson for the church of satan together with her husband uh, at the time and they had perhaps I don't know, pure speculation on my side, perhaps wanted to take over, you know, her being the daughter and uh, LaVe was sort of aging and failing health. And, you know, uh, maybe that's a natural kind of family dynamic in a way, but he wouldn't have any of that. And I think that's the main reason for their distancing from him and from the Church of Satan becoming quite vocal in their uh, antipathy. Um, and I think... Um, I don't know. It's sad, but I know that uh, he also said that we want we want our children to become independent, you know, and and that's basically what she uh, she became. She became independent, and I hope for her that 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 was what she was after. That it had sort of for her a happy resolution in a way. I, I will never know, um, but I think for him, of course, it hurts when you're in conflict with your kids, and and uh, I can't even imagine. So, but on the other hand, I think he was very much a stern, stern, stern uh, individualist, stern individual, but also an individualist. And although we have emotional ties to our kids that are, you know, um, possibly impossible to sever from our side, maybe it can be easier for kids to just cut the tie if they feel that it, there's a need for it. And then you have to ask yourself as a parent, is this my fault or is it, is it their fault or whatever? But the main thing is that you want your, you want your children to be happy. You know? And I think that was his take on it. Uh, maybe trying to make a virtue out of necessity, but you know, I, I, I wouldn't know. Okay. Wonderful. And uh, I wanted to ask you, Carl, have you, uh, do you know if uh, LaVey or, or have you read Mark Twain's The Mysterious Stranger? Uh, no, but I, one of my favorite books is uh, Letters from the Earth, of course. Yes, it's a wonderful, <laughs> yeah, speaking of Satanism. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah that's amazing. And of course, LaVey loved Twain, loved, loved, loved him. Yeah, because... Um, in the mysterious stranger, for me, sometimes it's the best depiction of uh, Satan or Lucifer. There's so many ways. It's a, mm -hmm. a multifaceted character these days. But there's an individual who's living in medieval times, and somebody comes up to him and basically tells him, "Look, uh, your life is just a dream. Every you've dreamt this religion, this God, this situation. You can do better. You just have to wake up and start over." And the figure is Satan. It's that sort of uh, yeah, punching of your ego and saying, tapping you on the shoulder, said, 
let's let's rewrite this whole world in your life uh yeah and that's the kind of satan i uh, enjoy do you think that's what love had in mind with satan that, or exactly that satan absolutely exactly not only because of the sort of the liberating luciferian aspect but also the sense of humor and and uh, satire that twain yeah, had yeah. there were many other great authors uh, that i've also written about in the book you know that he really um uh, liked uh, Somerset Maugham, the British writer. Then, of course, uh, uh, Henry Louis Mencken in the States, uh, Mark Twain, of course, and several others, Ben Hecht, um, that had this sort of, you know, um, diplomatically, we could call it Promethean. I would prefer to call it Luciferian. The spirit of, you know, wanting to shake people so that they wake up and get enlightened, uh, truly enlightened on, on tr deep, deep levels. And um, I understand why that has been an ostracized archetype in a way and why it has over time uh, come to, you know, actually be Satan or Lucifer. Because in the biblical story which is kind of boring i mean how often do you read the bible and say oh this is a great book someone really knew how to write uh it's it's kind of a dud actually um and i don't mean that as a, like a simple anti-christian trick it, it is very boring so but if you look at that the the role of satan or the trajectory was interesting because of the fact you know it was pride and and um esteem of self self-love that you know made satan be tossed out uh, the proud L lucifer uh, and it's just like uh, or so already there it's established right but but it does doesn't really uh, happen until i would say um, medieval times and again satan pops up like i said before like a power tool something to to uh, scare the kids with uh, because back then, uh, or earlier on, you mean, say, Christianity didn't really exist until the Church Council of Nicaea, that was like in the fourth century. But then they, they were so busy with building something, uh, and people were enthusiastic, as they usually are when you're building something. And that lasted for a long time. But then when it sort of got so powerful that it basically was on on the verge of becoming inert then you needed something else <laughs> then you need to bring out the 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 boogeyman and and that's exactly what happened you you have these clearer uh, devilish or satanic traits of that uh, negative romanticism but of course what they did was just create something that everyone who felt as an outsider could identify with so uh, unknowingly they created their own uh, their own adversary. Literally, they were their own worst enemy by presenting such a clear-cut uh, character in iconography, in writing, in sermons, whatever. I mean, all the cool people in church or in in town, they would say, "Whoa, I want to be on that side." Yeah. You know, <laughs> they're having all the fun and all the sex, and they can revel and they can go to hell. That sounds great. It, whereas <laughs> all the other, you know, norm called people were just suffering from birth to death. It makes no sense. Yeah, no, no. Plus, it's also a projection. Like in the, you know, in the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrews projected their sins on Azazel, the scapegoat, out in mm -hmm. the desert. So Satan just yeah. became a place we could throw our problems on and not face yeah. our, what we need to face. Exactly. But oh, here that is very interesting. Both these words, shadow and scapegoat, because Lavey was very fascinated by uh, what happens behind, you know, when you scratch the surface and, and look inside or what happens in the hidden room or in the true occult sphere, you know, these sort of gray eminences that actually run things. I'm not saying like the world does in any conspiratorial sense, right. but, you know, people who have power are not the ones who stand on things and shout the loudest. They're just loud mouths, you know, but there are there are per people who understand how these things work and they can control these narcissistic loudmouths uh, because they are usually so short sighted and so, um, well, stupid, frankly, that they will let themselves be taken advantage of by these, you know, <laughs> somewhat more smart people. And I would say that, yes, even though it sounds cynical, it is very much how the world works. There are these people who are uh, satanic and they wield a lot of power. And again, I don't mean that in a conspiratorial sense. It, we could just look at our own uh, friendships and, and relationships. There are always these people who are 
very happy to um, look at a situation, assess a group dynamic, and be quiet. They will know by not engaging exactly what will happen because humans always repeat the same mistakes over and over again. So with some kind of historical knowledge or basic psychology, again, learning to read people, you can foretell quite a lot about what's going to happen. And that's why, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer that our current uh, neo-Napoleon uh, is creating the havoc he's creating now on European soil, which is remarkable. But it's it's <laughs> it's not really news; it's old news. It's happened before. It happened in Germany uh, the previous time. It happened, yeah. So, with Napoleon, World War One. Yeah. Back to Twain, he said, "History doesn't repeat, but it certainly rhymes." Humans, uh, are, yeah, we, yeah. We're exactly. caught in we're caught in the wrong story, don't you think, Carl? We keep, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. But then again, you know, I think there are people that we could as ascribe to as being, you know, good people or possibly bad people. But there are these people behind the scenes who understand these things much, much, much better. And they are, again, by proxy, pretty, you know, uh, satanic or, or devilish in a way. And, and it's not a matter for us to judge. I mean, anyone who's on our side is by, by definition good. That's how humans work. Yeah, and if yeah. someone is, is on the other side, well, they're evil. But they might actually be the same kind of mind frame and same intelligence and same kind of behavioral uh, um, way of, of, uh, of dealing with things. But again, you know, the uh, acknowledgement of the shadow, let's return to that also. That's a very Jungian term, as we know. Uh, but what is Satan, if not the collective shadow of a Christian or Judeo-Christian culture. That's exactly what it is. So we have to acknowledge our own shadow in our own life, like negative experiences we've had, traumas we've had. Uh, they might even be transgenerational coming from earlier on. And uh, we just have to deal with it. Otherwise, it'll come back to, to bite us in the butt. That's what was in the olden times called demons, you know, uh, le leading to... Um, psychic problems neurosis psychosis other you know nervousness anxiety uh it's it's not demons it's just psychology um and on a collective level then the uh icon of the devil or or satan is sort of representative of all these things that christian culture tried to repress and what did they try to repress well, mainly sexuality, mainly the life-affirming, life-enhancing things. And of course, Satan represents all that. Uh, but again, for the outsiders who feel repressed, they will love that symbol. They will join that icon <laughs> and become sort of, uh, well, I guess, Satanists in a way, <laughs> uh, sim simply because of the fact that, that uh, why would you want to side with something that tries to tell you what you can't do? It's much better to, to be with the people who tell you what you can do or should do well said indeed i would agree and again uh, individuals like nietzsche and jung and freud they came out because they were necessary because in the victorian time sex was so repressed the femininity was so repressed uh, ecstasy was so repressed that people in europe were hurting big time they were going literally crazy yeah so we had to have these individuals like freud jung and Nietzsche to tell people, hey, there's another way, or Crowley, all these individuals to yeah. show there is a path of light. Yeah, absolutely. And then you have, you know, there are always these sort of vocal, uh, what do you call it, like uh, initiators in a way, or instigators or sp spark people who formulate in a, in a way. And, you know, the formulations are then disseminated in book form usually uh, at that time. And that's great because no one can change things like overnight through publishing of a book. That doesn't happen. It needs to be disseminated and as seed planted in many minds, in the soil of many minds, before it can sort of strike um, and, and start growing and, and leave the soil and come up towards the sun in a way. And I think that, that uh, the best way to do that, if you look at sort of historical things, it's not by being uh, sort of pseudo-religious or being a propagator or being a demagogue or being a proselytizer or having, you know, old school structures like that that are quasi or pseudo-religious. The best thing is simply to disseminate ideas of this nature in culture in fiction, in uh, uh, basically 
other uh, platforms, other areas than the ones they come from. They, they sometimes, they, ideas need, they need to shape shift uh, to take hold of people. And that's why, for instance, you have the power of the fairy tale because you can't disseminate a highfalutin philosophy to a three-year-old but you can tell a fairy tale that contains the same truth and they, the child will get it. So that said, I think that maybe, that's why I called uh, LaVey like a pop Nietzsche. Maybe Nietzsche uh, needed LaVey specifically in the US to sort of disseminate the ideas because he was TV friendly. He was magazine friendly. He was radio media friendly with his plastic horn and his dramatic cape <laughs> and all these sort of antics that were in part created for media, you know. Uh, but then he could disseminate the ideas and people said, wow, that makes a lot of sense. Whereas if they had tried to read, you know, the Antichrist or Thus Spake Zarathustra, they would have said, this is way too difficult for me. Well said indeed. And uh, just out of curiosity, do you know if Anton LaVey ever talked about the Gnostics? After all, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And the Gnostics did a great job of uh, criticizing the basically the demented God of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I don't know for a fact. We never discussed it. I can't recall reading you know, something specific. But I would say that LaVey and Satanism is, is Gnostic by definition. Because oh, yeah. again, you, know, uh, you have no God but yourself. That's a kind of a, a gateway at least to uh, you yourself being in touch with something higher. Whether that uh, stops inside yourself in your own individuality or whether you explore further out you know in the cosmos or wherever you go right. uh, it's still the responsibility is yours you know yours and yours alone you don't need a priesthood you don't need a church to tell you how to find god or or uh, because it's so condescending with these power structures that you know uh, you are just basically you know god's servant and you cannot understand god or or anything but through us and for this you have to pay so it's kind of a racket it's kind of a, a mafia for for uh, religious uh, uh, comfort in a way uh, so i think that he probably approved a, a lot of the uh, uh, gnostic uh, attitudes i think maybe he certainly understood the uh, the fact that much of that was in a language that was monotheist because culture was monotheist. That's not a problem. But I have seen uh, TV interviews with him where he speaks about uh, a lot of beautiful culture has been created in the name of God, meaning he was not so primitive that he said that, you know, uh, fuck God, anything with God, you know, Christian God is just bullshit, whatever. Uh, it, that's kind of a teenage heavy metal attitude. Uh, <laughs> he, he certainly acknowledged and he certainly loved a lot of the music specifically. I mean, one of his favorite was, was uh, Bach, you know, and Bach had that dilemma. Uh, the biggest market at the time was uh, Catholic and he was a Protestant. So even there you have this sort of conflict right. between, yeah. it's in, within the same religion, you know? So, but basically Bach was a, he was not an author. He was a, he was a composer of music, you know, but for him to be able to work so much with his compositions, uh, perhaps we should say there, thank God, you know, because he's, he's, he's simply so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Then he had to integrate all this Christian discourse, or let's call it, you know, BS in, in, the, um, in the lyrics or in the poetry that was integrated in many of the musical works. That was just the nature of the game. And radical artists of a similar kind, you know, um, uh, you can think of many different examples uh, who only had a chance to develop their own artistry through working with painting churches, for instance. You know, they could have their own secret canvases where people could be unclothed, but in the daytime, they had to, to make these huge frescoes based on the Old Testament. You know, it's kind of a dud. I mean, it, it, of course, there's a lot of sex and violence there, but you couldn't really show it as you as an artist wanted to show it. So I think that you have to acknowledge that every person is 
trapped in his own time or her own time. And Bach is just one example. And Lave acknowledged that so much beautiful art has been created in the name of God. And let's hope for the artist's sake that it was like a benevolent thing, that it wasn't like a torturous situation. Uh, but again, we, we should be very uh, grateful for the fact that so much culture has been preserved. And that, of course, has to do also with the... Um, um, what do you call it? Magna, <laughs> magnamosity. Oh, what's the word? The the uh, mm, grand scale hubris right. of of the Christian Church that they wanted their churches to be the biggest and the best. And for us, that's actually good because they still stand. You know, we can only evaluate history based on what culture remains. So you have like you know the Greek uh, temples and you have the Christian churches, and that's great because through those we can analyze what happened in those. Um, cultures and that that's fantastic and the same true also of of music that was more often than not composed in honor of god and the church and that's fine because we can still listen to the music and say that this is really beautiful stuff uh, they had a hard time <laughs> um, working i'm sure but they did it and we should be grateful for that yeah, well said again. And as we get to the end of the interview, I wanted to ask you a sort of a side question. Do you have any favorite depictions of Satan in movies? Uh, or top three, perhaps? Yeah. Well, off the top of my head, what, what actually came uh, when you asked that was actually a kind of a modern film. It's it's Al Pacino in The Devil's Advocate. Oh, that's mine too. Bingo. Yeah, you know, because there's just <laughs> something there that captures the essence without being uh, propagandistic, you know. Uh, I think the film in itself is, is uh, pretty good. It's a good sort of uh, devil film. But Al Pacino in particular and the sort of how they wrote The Devil, I find... Um, true to my own vision in a way um, he is the uh, kind of immune system that enjoys being a kind of disturbing force in this case some kind of attorney that uh, basically works with uh, criminal people but the reason he does that is to have hopefully some young idealist buck try to set things straight and right um, whether he will uh, succeed or fail that's only up to him you know and i think uh, keanu reeves is also very great in that film because i think he displays that kind of dilemma where you know uh, will you be corrupt or will you be good-hearted you know <laughs> and then of course that <laughs> wonderful thing when you realize that his mom is actually some Christian zealot that right. was seduced by the devil. I mean, it's uh -huh. a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, so that would be one. And then there's another one uh, called uh, Angel on My Shoulder by Archie Mayo. Uh, uh, the director is from 1946. Well worth checking out. And it's uh, in that kind of Mark Twainish uh, vein in the sense that the devil comes up from hell and he, he just you know, he's, he's appalled. <laughs> he's appalled by what he, <laughs> what he sees in the human sphere. And it's like much, much worse than ever could have been fantasies, but created by some kind of, you know, devil or Satan. So that's a funny <laughs> movie, but it's really to the point. It was also one of, of LaVey's uh, uh, favorite movies. Uh, so that would be two obvious ones. And uh, I think, I don't know. I think I have to settle for those because these questions are very hard. I have to think hard. No, Although I, I have many films in my mind, uh, just these things of. Uh, but I gave you two though, and they're really yeah, good. good. I think yeah. they're great, great devil films. Yeah, there's the one. Oh, what's it? I'm forgetting the title. Elizabeth Hurley plays Satan. Of course, she's very good in the eyes. Yeah. Was it Bedeviled or Bewitched? One of those. Oh, yeah. I haven't seen that. Actually, now it's I came based to on the original one with Dudley Moore. Oh, that one. Okay. Yeah, I haven't seen that. So, but the one I came to think of also is, is uh, a very, very strange film. It's, it's an old Danish Swedish film from the 20s mm. uh, called uh, in English uh, Witchcraft Through the Ages. Uh, it was originally called Hexam, the Witch. And it's, it was one of the, the most, the most expensive film made in Denmark and Sweden at the time wow. because it used a lot of trick photography and superimpositions. And it has these wild, wild scenes of uh, 
you know, Christian psychosis, and uh, there's a devil, and there's like a, the witch's Sabbath, and it's just amazing stuff uh, from 19, I don't know, 1922, I think. It's a remarkable film. That should be easy to find also. It's called Witchcraft Through the Ages. And uh, so those three would be my uh, top devil films today. Awesome. Wonderful. We'll have to check it out. And Vince, any last quick question before we wrap it up? Oh, quick. <laughs> How can anything be quick with such a deep subject? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, Carl, I was wondering, um, um, is there anything in LaVey's philosophy that you've seen and know about that would prevent uh, people that adhere to that philosophy from using lies or deception, which of course are the traditional tropes of the devil, right? L using lies and deception to get what they want in the world, you know, to, to give themselves pleasure at the expense of others? Well, that's, that is a big question. And, and uh, I don't feel uh, that anyone uh, could answer for other people in that kind of, you know, uh, big moral questions. Uh, I think we're all familiar with um, the concept of the, the white lie, you know, which is supposedly, I think one definition of it is that it doesn't really hurt someone else. Actually, it might even be used to, to protect someone from being hurt, for instance. Yeah. Uh, so I think that, but that, it's probably something that everybody has used at some point. Actually, we might be doing it every day. I don't know. I don't count. But but the thing is that that, I think, is a flexible term. The white lie can be depending on our sub subjective needs. And for instance, uh, in a scenario of, of uh, desperation or dismay or despair even, you know, we might look at what we're saying as a white lie. But yeah. it might and actually. We lie to from, ourselves from, all the time. Yeah, we don't exactly. want to face things. Yeah, but from, from the bird's eye view, it might actually have become a black lie <laughs> or, or like an <laughs> evil lie in the sense that we are hurting other people by uh, not telling the truth right there and then. So I, I, I can't answer that. It's, it's such a huge um, moral issue. Well, and again, how about, I, how about yeah. the deliberate? Uh, how about the deliberate uh, fabrication of a lie to get what you right. want? Right. Like, I mean, deception. If, yeah. If you want somebody's wife and you tell them, though, you know, I saw your husband cheating with uh, so and so, and it's a total lie because this right. guy wants to. Uh, what about that? What would he think about something like that? Uh, I think he would not like it because you, to, to me, when you describe it, it sounds like a short-sighted uh, manipulation to get something you want, uh, but it will have implications, ramifications uh, if it goes through, meaning that, you know, uh, he gets to, to have sex with that wife and their marriage is destroyed, et cetera, et cetera. When things are unwrapped and, and uh, so, sort of what we call disentangled, uh, the truth may come out. It actually very often does, doesn't it? Uh, in politics, we have, you know, the third power of, of journalism and, and that kind of thing. You know, the truth actually comes out most of the time, sooner or later. And then the short-sighted pleasure might come back to not bite you in the butt, but actually might hit you over the head. And then you have to ask yourself, was this satanic or was it just plain stupid? I think that uh, satanic manipulation needs to be uh, much more thought through and strategized because basically what you're doing in magical ritual is that you're creating a scenario in the let's you know the ether or the cosmos whatever that you want to play out but you're not really that interested in how it plays out or who is involved in this you just want the result in a way and that's that's part of that the dynamic and i think also um why magic can be quite healthy because you don't have to confront every enemy you have you don't have to approach any everyone that you want to approach by this sort of very laborious um uh, um uh, strategies in a way you can ritualize it instead and and focus on what you want to have happen and then for reasons that i can't explain now or anyone uh, because our science doesn't allow it then those things will happen that is if you believe in magic then then you can affect that kind of outer change through inner um uh, shenanigans or mechanics and and uh, it's not a way to uh, escape moral implications, but at least you're not lying because in the ritual moment, you're true to yourself saying, I want this to happen. And you don't have to be involved all the time with um, all the steps of how you get to that point in, in 
outer objective reality. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, Carl, we are at the end. Uh, uh, for the audience, I definitely highly recommend Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan. It is full of wisdom and Sophia, and uh, it is um, structured where you, uh, well, tell the audience how it's structured. It's not your traditional book, Carl. No, it, it, it's it's um, basically, uh, I made a film first, and I interviewed a lot of people that I some had met um way back when at the black house or sort of in the vicinity uh, and some people i met later on also but the premise of this entire project is that i had the feeling that lave was communicating things to me when i was there sort of between the lines we were talking about a lot of things hanging out just basically interacting like friends and he was recommending culture etc cetera, etc cetera. but whenever i left the house early in the mornings uh, it's like whoa what happened it was like too much to take in and some of these things bloomed later on you know so the premise was how did the others feel did they feel something similar and when i started investigating this and asking them a, like a set of standard questions it dawned on us all that yeah this was remarkable because he i think he tried to create a kind of a legacy that was not only the books not only his kids not only that but it was also a legacy of being alive in the minds of people that he uh, realized would be uh, good soil for it. So I was jokingly saying that maybe he saw that, you know, one day Carl will write a book about this conversation we're having right now in 1989. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. how good magicians work, you know. <laughs> so, but basically, I wanted to contextualize these interviews by, uh, I think there's four or five initial chapters that are written by me being basically my own recollections and memories focusing on um, uh, people he liked, you know, music he liked, movies he liked, and uh, sources of inspiration for him. So I'm trying to contextualize him almost in a biographical way, but the, the book is not a biography. You could call it like a patchwork, a quilt uh, biography in a way, with these different voices all uh, quilt in to create a, a patchwork quilt or something, a gazamt uh, memory in a way. Wonderful. And um, where can people find out more about you? And of course, it will be in the show notes. But for those listening in audio, where can they find more about your work and the book? Yeah, that's uh, the, the best thing. I mean, uh, everyone is on all platforms, I guess. And I'm also on all platforms. But the best way to begin uh, as a gateway is through my own website, which is very simple. It's my name.com. So it's carlabrahamson.com. That's Carl with a C and Abrahamson with two S's carlabrahamson.com and that that has all the information about me as an author and other things i've done and also information about the books and also this book wonderful and thanks well we are really at the end vance thanks for keeping us company on this journey oh sure uh, yeah it was a very interesting and enlightening uh session here learned a lot more about the uh philosophy of uh, anton LaVey's satanism I don't agree with it all, um, the philosophy, I have to say that. I think there are some things that we haven't talked about in the interview, but uh, there are positive things about it, too. And uh, we do share some of the tenets um, between uh, LaVey's philosophy and Gnosticism. Yeah, everything casts a shadow and everything has light and dark. That's, that's uh, right. yeah, yep. duality. That's what uh, Anton was talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Carl, thank you very much for coming on Aeon Byte. We appreciate your time. Uh, really enjoyed the book and good luck with all your projects. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And, and um, yeah, just uh, enjoy the book. Thank you. And there you have it, you shining crazy diamonds. The full hellish interview with Carl Abrahamson. First part of our Devil Doubleheader. Let us now to our interview with Mac Frederick on his book, A Meeting at the Crossroads, Robert Johnson and the Devil. Full for all subscribers. Hell is for children, or is it? This is the Aeon Bide interview, and with us we definitely have the pleasure of being joined by Matthew Frederick to discuss a book that I really enjoyed, A Meeting at the Crossroads, Robert Johnson and the Devil. Matt, thank you very much for coming on the show. 
Well, thank you very much for having me. It, um, for me, it feels a little bit weird to be, I suppose, on the proverbial other side of the desk. Uh, I've been a broadcaster for a very long time, so I'm quite used to interviewing people, but uh, being interviewed is a whole different kettle of fish. Oh, well, wonderful. I think you'll do great. And of course, we don't mind if you throw questions back at us. That's what makes it fun. But we definitely want to focus on your book. And with us is someone who always gives the devil his dues and sometimes his blues. And that's the Moondog Vance. Vance, how are you doing? Oh, I'm just great. Yeah. I'm uh, trying to see sharp, but usually I be flat. Song. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, you are the musician here. Uh, I'm a music fan, but I don't have anything so, sort of a, a music ear. So, but so I think you'll definitely complement this too. So, Matt, let's talk about you a little bit about your background. Uh, tell us about yourself and how you became interested in both the blues and esoteric topics. Well, I am a guy from, at the moment, I live in Melbourne, Australia. I grew up in rural Victoria, where we had two main radio stations. One played the cricket and the football, which is what we listened to on the weekends. Um, real football, where they have an oval and kick it through white sticks, not that that strange <laughs> kind of yeah. chess between coaches. <laughs> and um, the other station was a mix between top 40 and classic rock, so... A lot of, I suppose, songs that later when I grew up, I realized were derived from the blues. I was a voracious listener to music from a very young age. And, you know, I remember hearing bands like Cream on the radio, their live version of Crossroads. I remember hearing when I was very, very young, hearing The Who on the radio. Of course, they uh, did their wonderful version of Sonny Bill Williamson's uh, Eyesight to the Blind. Right. So, you know, music always becomes part of who you are and then when you're a teenager i think it's almost required to go through a phase where you like the music of the doors and led zeppelin and the like and some people are happy with that others who are of the more nerdy persuasion like to dig back and see what they can find and see where they came from and that's what i did discovering the music of john mayle and of course on the um famous beano album john and eric do their version of robert johnson's rambling on my mind traveling back and hearing muddy waters and I mean, there's a stage where you think that when you discover Robert Johnson, you found the beginning. Of course, the history goes back a lot further, and I try and outline that in my book and show who um, influenced Robert Johnson. But you go through and you discover different musicians, different artists. And as I grew up, I maintained that love of music. And uh, amongst all the various other things I was doing, I sort of maintained that in sort of my career. And I worked for one of the newspapers for a long time here in Melbourne doing gig listings and writing occasionally about music, um, became a radio host, actually made my living from that for a couple of years before I realized that um, eating was a struggle. So um, <laughs> now I do my radio program on a volunteer basis once a week, and I do focus on the blues. And through that, I've had opportunities to travel to the States, to be a tour guide, taking people through the deep South and all the rest of it. On the other side of the coin, I've always maintained an interest in esoteric things. You know, when I was a, I was a young fella, I realized that the library's books on witchcraft were a reliable source of pictures of ladies without their clothes on, which in the pre-internet times was a rare and valuable <laughs> thing. Oh yeah. Um, and you know, you like, like a lot of kids do, you discover, um, you know, the writings of people like William Seabrook, um, Israel Regardi, Peter J. Carroll. And that's always been an interest. And on top of that, my um, academic background, the piece of paper on my wall says studies in Western traditions, which was a, a unique course offered at the university I went to, which covered everything from, well, look, they had uh, Porphyry's Cave of the Nymphs as uh, a reading on the reading list for first years, which gives you a bit of an idea of what the background was. Indeed. Yeah. That's great. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah. Music and the esoteric are a wonderful crossroads that we'll definitely get into. Uh, I'd like to, just as sort of as a uh, uh, summary, your book is well written. It's uh, it's tight, it's concise, but you cover so much ground. And again, the crossroads you hit is just uh, it's just wonderful. Um, but uh, let me quote your book. You write, "It is fair to say that for many people." Robert Johnson is the blues, defining the image of the music and the people who play it. 
His life story has all the excitement of a typical rock and roll biography, but with the added romance of going to the source of things. That is the wellspring, the archetype through which we understand the stories of Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin, Amy Winehouse, and all the other members of the famed 27 Club. As we will discover, the story of the crossroads is bigger than that of Robert Johnson, echoing African-American folklore, diaspora religion, and ancient archetypes. Do you think that's a good summary of it? I think so. <laughs> I, I think so. I, I, I suppose I did write that, so I can't say it's, it's bad. <laughs> um, but that does, Unless it was that, your that... muse and you were just the vessel. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, but yeah, that is what the book's about. The... Um, the story of Robert Johnson is fascinating. And in the last um, 20 years or so through um, fantastic researchers like Elijah Wald, um, Bruce Conforth, Gail Dean Wadlow, um, we know a lot about Robert Johnson. And there's been a lot of work in, I suppose, peeling back the layers of the myth to understand the person. And that's a really wonderful and valuable thing to do. And we now know a lot more about Robert Johnson than we know about many of his contemporaries. But despite all that, the myth still remains. And I suppose what inspired me to write the book was realizing that if a myth remains, then that myth must be important. It must mean something. Even Mm -hmm. though we know that Robert Johnson, you know, almost certainly didn't meet Mephistopheles somewhere, (laughs) you know, in the middle of Mississippi, the story is told for a reason. And, you know, those reasons can be complex. And the aim of the book is to unpack that and understand that sort of mythic truth, that mythic, mythic resonance that leads us to, continue to tell a story whether we're listening to a record or watching uh the karate kid pretend to play a telecaster uh, yes i do remember that movie good movie yeah awesome i, I love it because again myths are alive and music is, is alive and these things change and we change and they transform us but first why don't we get into a little bit of more i guess not mundane history but more mainstream history perhaps uh what would you say is the history of the blues and i do like this quote by uh, the man himself Jimi hendrix who said uh the blues are easy to play but hard to feel and as you write we can say that the blues came out of africa but was not born in africa well yeah you're absolutely right to um highlight that uh, second quote the root the blues has deep roots in africa the people who created the music were of african origin although we've got to be very careful not to define africa as a monoculture it's you know larger and more diverse than europe there are so many different cultures there and it's through that combination unfortunately through the great crime that was the slave trade that those elements that became the blues later formed i try to highlight some of the aspects of the blues that people maybe don't consider when defining the music so i think anyone who's a musician you know might have picked up their you know their uh how to play music book and it says here's how you play the blues it's a 12 bar pattern and (laughs) you know that's if you play that you'll get something that sounds like the blues but the music elements that really define the music are a rhythm based on triplet beats so that allows for syncopation obviously you get that syncopation in early jazz as well and also a tonality that's based on the heavy use of microtones those notes that are between the keys of the piano and uh, if you listen to any blues singer especially you can really hear that strongly uh, muddy waters was an absolute master of it sliding up and down like a trombone but stopping at these specific points in between uh the western tones outside of the Western scale to really create emotional emphasis. And you see that in a lot of the blues instruments where what they're trying to do is imitate that capability of the human voice to create these extra tones, whether it's the um, guitarist bending his notes or playing slide guitar or even pianist playing trills. And uh, the way a pianist, um, you know, look at a master like Otis Spann, the way he combines those trills with a standard boogie woogie rhythm creates in itself, not only that impression of microtones, but these incredibly complex set of polyrhythms that uh, is something that's almost exists outside of uh, Western understandings of music. And when that kind of African conception is combined with the European music that existed in America, whether it's the classical traditions or the folk traditions, it does create something that's very new and special and uniquely American. 
Yes, indeed. And uh, would you say uh, which came first? Or I guess I think you're right. It's a chicken and the egg scenario. Jazz or blues, Matt? That is a uh, a perennial question. I suppose (laughs) it's easy to, um, there's an easy narrative that says that the blues is the simpler form out of which jazz evolved. Um, One big challenge of that is, of course, that the blues is not as simple as it first appears. And the other is that, that they were being created simultaneously, often in the same places. So we think of the blues as being sometimes of being from Mississippi, quite likely its origins are more in Louisiana, um, New Orleans, where at the same time, you know, Cajun music was de- being developed. And of course, jazz. And a lot of the people who were early jazz musicians were also blues musicians they'd play what needed to be played and those different vocabularies crossed over perhaps it's better to define the music not by what it is by but by in what context it was played what was the music for jazz was definitely music for rowdiness and good times but uh the uh blues could definitely get a lot rowdier a lot deeper and very very rough very cool and uh, the other thing that should definitely be uh, explained about the blues, and this will be a platform as we continue and get more occult, but blues was a very social expression, right? As, uh, as you write yourself, Bessie Smith sang of experiences of racism, of poverty, of gambling, and freedom, independence, and free sexuality. Ma Rainey sang openly of lesbianism and bisexuality. So the blues itself was sort of an activist, uh, art, uh, a release, cathartic, but it was social. Very much. It allowed you to express the things that maybe might not be permitted, um, whether it is expressing sexuality or violence. And sometimes the blues lyrics could be you know, quite terrible. You look back at a song like Ain't Nobody's Business If I Do, One of These mm-hmm. Days I May Go Crazy, Find a Shotgun and Murder My Baby. Now, the person singing that might not be expressing that as a thing they genuinely wish to do, but they're still expressing some of their emotions. And in that way, it really is fulfilling a function of, um, well, a a lot of African-American music today. You look at the lyrics of um, Kanye West that are being released literally as we speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. It was definitely edgy. And uh, it certainly, uh, I guess, I'm sure it, it clashed with we might say mainstream black music, didn't it? I mean, uh, I'm sure the church going folk were not happy about the blues. <laughs> there, there, there's always been an element of that. Now, it's it's easy to exaggerate that. Um, I know a lot of blues singers. I've spoken to a lot of blues singers who say they first learned to play music in the church. They mm-hmm. would go to um, gospel services in the morning, and they would hear tonalities and sounds that they recognized also in the blues and from that they were able to go from one to the other but there is a certain point where the as they say in ghostbusters you don't cross the streams (laughs) love it um there's the there's the um example i cite in the book more recently of um the mississippi marvel based in clarkstead who's actually a preacher and also a very good blues singer and um he recorded and released one album but only on the conditions that nobody knew who he was because he would be potentially risking losing his congregation. No, that makes sense. And yeah, and, and I'm sure uh, without saying it, it's obvious that the blues was a huge influence on the formation of rock and roll. I remember there's stories of Elvis Presley putting out his first songs on the radio and people across the country saying, who is this new black singer? <laughs> so- well, even the, you look at Elvis Presley's um, first recording, um, well, first um, commercial recording, That's All Right, Mama, that was a song by uh, Arthur Big Boy Crudup. Uh-huh. Who, uh, and that song had been a hit previously. And effectively, Sam Phillips took Elvis in the studio and Sam Phillips' way of recording was just to push people, get them recording as long as they could until they reached that point where they did something great. And Elvis was trying to sing ballads and uh-huh. pop songs until he was pushed and said, no, sing something you know, sing something that makes you feel. So he just, it's a record he knew, he knew by heart. He yelled out the um, chords of the band, and off they went. Wow, very cool. Yeah, and like you said, uh, uh, then later on, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, all these bands were just uh, 
complete it was really a foundation of their own music very much so very much so very cool what about you vince do you play the blues you're again you're the musician what do you think oh yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah if i if i had a dollar for every time i played stormy monday i probably uh have a dollar for every time I play Stormy Monday. <laughs> well, with inflation, it might not mean much today, but you play yeah, it a more lot. like a penny. You know, they, they don't play, they don't pay blues musicians too much uh, usually. But it was always something we'd have, you know, available at a wedding if nobody, if nobody wanted to, uh, um, if, if nobody could think of a good song or we ran out of songs, you know, in a particular band you're in. You know, the blues was always something. You ah, oh, blues and B flat. You'd call it out. And uh, and uh, oh, see, even Birdie sings the blues over there. You can hear him. <laughs> but sure, yeah, you bet. I don't know if I was the master that some of the greats are at it, but you know, I played blues on the sax, on the guitar, on the keyboards. Um, you're talking about um, you know the crossover between gospel music and the blues. I think that's how you know uh, the B3 organ got its start uh, in the blues because uh, they'd have organs in the churches. And so they'd uh, they, they'd uh, eventually translate the organ playing into um, into the blues. So you know, B three is a great blues instrument. So one of my favorites. And uh, on the converse of that, there's a uh, amazing tradition of sacred steel guitar, where the lapsi on the pedal steel were used as the major worship instrument in a whole series of churches. You can hear that influence in. Uh, Musicians like Robert Randolph, who grew up in that tradition. Yeah, I hadn't heard that too much, but uh, maybe more in Hawaii. <laughs> 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 See, out your ways, it was closer to Australia. Yeah, so that, yeah, but probably, you know, not so, I'm not, I, in my experience, not so much anymore, but maybe way back in the early 20th century, it was more prevalent. Maybe the country guys took it over and then the blues music say, ah, oh, the country guys got it quite possibly and matt why is it called the blues is it for obvious reasons well we actually don't know um it could be named after the emotion the early songs were called the blues but we anything i could say would be purely speculation blue notes right uses the blue notes that's true the uh the flattened third the flattened fifth and that little uh that little spot in between your major and minor thirds yep Interesting. Yeah. Again, it's speculation. And, uh, well, why don't we get into Robert Johnson himself? Uh, Tell us a little bit about about his uh, brief life and how he came to fame and uh, how, well, he definitely had a tragic end. Yeah, Robert Johnson's story is a fascinating one. I suppose in some ways it's typical of many people in his time and place. In some ways it's... um, quite exceptional certainly he's still remembered today while many people are sadly forgotten but he was born in hazelhurst mississippi in um quite um i suppose broken circumstances his mother had uh, split had split up and shacked up with somebody else and then she split up again and the family moved down to memphis in a combined home and even though we think of him as being a mississippi artist a lot of his formative years were spent in memphis um his family home wasn't too far from what was then the the center of uh, Memphis African American life, Beale Street, and it would have been there that he was first exposed to the blues, but not necessarily what we might think of as Delta blues. He would have heard um, music inspired by W. C. Handy, which has a more jazzy bent and often a more schooled musician bent. He would have heard the local jug band music quite regularly, um, so he would have been exposed to a lot of different kinds of music. Um, he eventually moved back to Mississippi, although um, recent uh, research has shown he did travel back to Memphis quite often, um, learned to drive relatively young and go between the two areas, got married very young at about the age of 17. Um, unfortunately, his wife died in childbirth. Uh, he appears to have been away when that happened, either away for work or possibly away playing music. It's easy to speculate that this was a... Um, crucial point in his life where he maybe made the decision to give up on being a homeowner instead of becoming a musician. But that really is speculation. We really don't know. We do know that he did not long after that really, you know, and start playing music around at a lot of the um, local 
well, you call them juke joints, really informal gatherings of musicians. Often a juke joint is just somebody's home where they uh, put out a hat and collect money in order to help them pay their rent. And uh, the story goes that he actually wasn't very good. There's a um, couple of quotes from Sun House when he was interviewed in the 60s that said he'd just go boom, bap, a dog wouldn't want to hear it. You know, he'd get up when uh, people were having breaks and wanted to go have a drink or gamble. Yeah. And he'd lose their crowd. Um, I don't know if it's quite that he wasn't a competent musician. I think my speculation is that he wasn't playing the music that that crowd wanted to hear. Um, the Delta isn't very far from Memphis, but music could be very different. It's heavily rhythmic. Um, the rhythms can be quite complex. If you listen to an artist like Charlie Patton, he's often playing a 3-4 rhythm over a 4-4 four, four rhythm, combining into a 12-8 sometimes. So it can get very complex, but easy to dance to and loud for a rowdy crowd, which might not have been the kind of music Johnson was learning in Memphis. So it could be that he played, but he wasn't playing what the crowd wanted to hear. What we do know is he then disappeared for a certain period of time. Exactly how long, again, we can't be certain. Chronology is a little bit vague, but uh, anything between three and 18 months. And during that time, he... Um, well, I, I, what I, I, year I, I, was this so the audience can get a get a, a feel? He was born in 1911. When did he disappear? Uh, when did he disappear? Oh my goodness! Now I've got to now you put me on the spot. I've got to remember all of my um. Well, <laughs> around my what time? Dates. At least, at least the around audience know it's the 20th century, earlier. Around century. about around about 1930. Mm. Um, and uh, moving forward, when he came back, uh, Sunhouse expresses am amazement about um, how much Johnson had improved. Um, in one interview from the 60s, when he's pushed on that, he says he must have sold himself to the devil to learn to play like that. Now, that doesn't mean he, he necessarily believed Johnson had sold himself to the devil. It's sort of a bit of an expression, but it does show how much he had improved. What we do know is during that time, he met a mentor called Ike Zinnemann, who was a bootlegger and local musician and that's a, a really strange part of the story because there's been a lot of research into this relationship. And Ike seems to have really taken Johnson on as a protege. Johnson moved into Ike's home. He's, there are interviews with his family where they're talking about this. Um, he lived with them, had a room in the house. Um, Ike would take Johnson out to play with him at the various uh, Duke Johnson house parties. And unusually, he would uh, tutor Johnson... Uh, late at night in the graveyard across the road from the family home, sitting on the tombstones, which is a very uh, spooky and diabolical way to learn the guitar and certainly adds that sort of sense of supernaturalism into the story. But what's what I find also odd about this whole relationship is at the end when Johnson got to the point where he could make it on his own, he was um, sent out. It was done. We don't know if he ever saw Zinnemann again. He might have in his travels, but there's no record of it. But he was trained up. He learned his he learned his craft, and he was sent out as a uh, as a walking musician, as a fellow craft. Oh wow! And um, you said that his wife died in childbirth. That is, uh, did the child survive? No, no, that oh, that oh, child didn't survive. Pity. Oh, yeah, okay. He so, did have a child later on, but um, that's a that's a separate situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, yeah, he disappeared, came back to Allent, and uh, then how famous was he while he was alive? Not especially. He did mm. have one hit. Um, he had a song called Terraplane Blues, which sold reasonably well. Um, there is a story of him busking on the street and someone requesting that song and him looking and saying, that's my song, and playing it and drawing a crowd. But none of his other records really... Um, really sold in huge quantities. The main record, the main market selling records at the time wasn't just selling for people to play in their homes, it was also selling to jukeboxes. And um, it appears not to have really taken in that market. He was able to make a living as a musician, but he wasn't especially famous. That being said, um, he did know a lot of people and his influence seems to spread from there. So he certainly appears to have known uh, Rice Miller, the second person to go with Sonny Boy Williamson, quite likely knew uh, Elmore James, although there's no direct evidence of that. Um, but he uh, most certainly did know Robert Jr. Lockwood, whose uh, mother he shacked up with for a period of time. Robert Jr. Lockwood probably isn't best known 
outside of the blues circles, but he was um, one of the defining guitarists in Chicago blues in the 1950s and 60s, particularly as a backup guitarist. So if you listen to a lot of the music by um, by Sonny Boy Williamson, he's often the one playing guitar in the background there. And he really wrote the book on a lot of the um, way of backing up a musician in that electric Chicago style. And he was directly influenced by Robert Johnson. Whether Johnson influenced the style he was known for, we don't know, but he definitely learned Robert Johnson's style directly off Johnson. And he could continue to play that right up to uh, his eventual passing. Although later in life, he did get a little bit grumpy about being asked about Robert Johnson all the time and not <laughs> about his own quite magnificent contributions to uh, the vocabulary of the blues. Uh, so Johnson was, uh, he just became more and more famous after his death, more legendary, if you would. Yeah, there's a there's a few instances that are unusual. One is the um, famous from Spirituals to Swing concert, which was held in New York City at Carnegie Hall and was a way to show the evolution of African-American music from, like the title says, from Spirituals all the way up to Swing. And, you know, lots and lots of people were there playing various styles of music. And the intent was to have Robert Johnson along. Um, a lot of the white musicologists and record collectors at the time had discovered his music and they had decided that he was um, sort of the pinnacle of that style. So they went out searching for him. Unfortunately, he had already passed. So by the time the um, concert was held, they couldn't have Johnson. So instead, they had a phonograph on the stage and they just played some of his records after a rather hagiographic speech. So that really is where uh, legend starts. At the same time, in the African American community, his music was still um, played. There has been, have been some scholars who argue that he was a minor figure on the influence of African-American uh, blues music. I'm, I'm not convinced by that. Um, for one thing, obviously, Robert Jr. Lockwood was such an influential guitarist. The other, of course, is Muddy Waters, right up to the end of his life, always cited um, Robert Johnson as one of his primary influences. And I think it's impossible to underestimate the influence of Muddy Waters. Then you get artists like Elmore James and Dust My Broom and his own version of Crossroads, which are clearly inspired by Johnson. And uh, again, incredibly influential. Wonderful. Well, let's talk about his death in 1938. Again, uh, and more isn't that just more mystery and more tragedy, if you would? Oh, very much so. His death is, um, it, it's hard to pin down exactly what happened. There's various stories and not all the stories have necessarily been told by people who were there. But we do know he was playing a juke joint that was known as or at a place called Three Forks in Mississippi. And that at one point he drank some moonshine liquor that was not too good. Now, drinking moonshine, I don't know if you've ever done it. There's always a slight element of risk if you don't know who the, um, who the producer is. But um, it appears the story goes it was deliberately poisoned because Johnson had been uh, making eyes at the wrong person's wife and uh, ended up being sick and dying a few days later. Uh, Rice Miller, Sonny Boy Williamson, who I mentioned before, would later tell stories of Robert Johnson crawling on the floor and howling like a dog and eventually dying in Sonny Boy's arms. Um, Sonny Boy was a bit of a rogue and a storyteller. That was how he made his living beyond music. So it's hard, it's hard to say that's exactly true, but it does appear that he's, the circumstance of his death was suspicious. His death certificate, which has been uncovered, mentions... Um, syphilis but that was a bit of a um sort of uh, uh, another african-american guy died or just write down syphilis on the death certificate what else can it be and uh, they also mentioned on his um, death certificate that he was playing banjo at the time which uh there's no yeah. other record of him playing so we can think that uh, there there's more to it than what was on the death certificate uh yeah short life but he certainly made history well why don't we move to uh old nick himself introduce oh. the big guy no in fact let's stop i have one more question before we give the devil his due and you write that the myth of robert johnson happened really what 1960 by a certain song by uh, cousin leroy rosier yeah that's a that's an interesting one that um that was a song i have that in my record collection and i've listened to it no, dozens of times, but um, it wasn't until recently when I was reading a, another wonderful um, study into the blues tradition called Beyond the Crossroads, The Devil and the Blues Tradition by Adam Gussow, 
who is also the harmonica player in the great, uh, or was the harmonica player in the great blues duo Satan and Adam, um, where he cites that. So Cousin Leroy was a musician at the time, not particularly well known. He did have a few minor hits. There's a song of his uh, Beyond the River that's uh, played a lot in the Belgian popcorn dance scene. But this song of his Crossroads is fascinating because it's um, it's a sort of a bit of a boastful song you know it's like um bo diddley saying you know i walked 27 miles of what barbed wire got cobra snake for a neck try it's you know building yourself up but the the lyrics are what is it i walked down to the crossroads there i learned how to play guitar well a man walked up said son let me tune it that was the devil uh-huh. i mean that's that's the story and in the final verse he said well baby will you tell me where did you learn well i walked down the crossroad that's where i got my lesson so it's uh it's outlining this story very clearly and that song was recorded in the late 50s not released until i think 1962 but i cite that because i think there is a line of interpretation of the robert johnson story that goes that the story of selling a soul to the crossroads was added later by white blues fans in an attempt to add some mystique to this musician that they loved but when you look at that story that song by Cousin Leroy, and look at some of the other stories that I cite, you can see quite clearly this idea of a musician selling his soul to the devil to become a musician is there in African-American folklore. It doesn't mean that people believe this is a thing that musicians did, but it does say something about the position they held, what people thought of them, both positive and negative. And uh, it does show us that even if we don't have any record directly of that story being associated with Johnson. And the records are a little bit hard to tell. There are some possible possibilities that it was during his time, but they're a little bit vague. We definitely know he was the kind of person that the story would have been told about. No, it makes sense. All right. Well, why don't we get to uh, Lucifer Morningstar? And uh, as you write in your book, the devil and the blues uh, definitely go together and he's been appeared in many songs in the blues but unlike uh, this devil we're really not talking about the devil from the exorcist or uh, the omen the prince of darkness that sort of a uh, trope of ultimate evil for uh for the blues he's more of a character of a uh He has more positive uh, traits. And as you write, he serves as a breaker of social and physical bonds. So he really goes uh, very well hand in hand with the old uh, uh, rebellion that the blues is about. Yeah, well, you know, being on this show, I can say it's very close to that sort of Gnostic idea of the Uh, devil. Yeah. Um, And you listen to some of those early blues songs where they talk about you know, done, sold my soul to the devil, whatever. And they're not songs of tragedy or loss. They're songs of liberation. I've done this and now I'm free to do what I want to do. If all the people that are holding me back are on the side of God, then I've only really got one option. And songs like that were incredibly popular. Um, The Devil Sold. And that's why when you look at um, Johnson's discography, he's got his song Preaching Blues, Up Jump the Devil. And that's what it says on the record label. But um, if you listen to the lyrics, it doesn't actually mention the devil at all. But the record label knew that devil song sold. So they they put that on there in an attempt to uh, reach the right market. Mm, well said indeed. Yeah, I think it makes sense. I mean, this is, and we'll break it down even more, but this is, uh, you're right, it's very Gnostic because when you look at the plight of the African-American just coming out of slavery, being screwed over by Jim Crow and other issues. I mean, they are they are on the margins. So of course, and then you've got the blue singers and uh, and guitar players. They're the hero fans of the black community. The you know, it's the the priests, the the takers, the ones who explore the unconscious. So they're going to take it even further, and they're basically going to start meeting these this sort of Promethean character who does not care about society because the world has enslaved them. The world has put them on the margins. So they're going to bond with this uh, outsider archetype or spirit, and they have no problem dealing with them because both the devil and the African-American are on the margins of society. 
That's a really good way to interpret it. It's, a, it's saying, well, you want me to be on the outside? I definitely am going to be on the outside. <laughs> yeah. And there's a strange way in which um, a blues performance and a church service mirror one another. Um, mm. in a, if you go to a, if you go to a uh, blues performance where, you know, you're, there's, there's uh, not too many tourists, let's just say, um, it's an interactive performance. People are yelling out and they're saying, preach it, say it again, go on, just like when you go to a gospel church service. Um, they act in the same way, but for very different ends. So yes, the um, blues singer and the preacher both uh, take leadership roles, but in this participatory um, environment where everyone is contributing to create the sensation of either being together with God or being together apart from God in the a sinful life and through that i suppose there is a form of salvation can be found now it can be easy to split this up completely and a lot of people would go and still do go to a blues show on a saturday night and the church service on a sunday morning but there is a point where they no longer work together um you see yeah, that, that in makes the- sense. yeah that makes sense yeah and again uh the gnostics were again the outcasts of society they felt they were outcasts in the world uh, but they were also shamanistic. It was an experiential religion. It wasn't about faith saves and obey these commandments. So this certainly relates to, like you said, uh, gospel music and the blues where you are in rapture with higher powers and your own soul. And uh, again, if you, you go to a blues show, sometimes people will appear to be in rapture. They'll just start yeah. dancing the way they normally wouldn't, just like they would at a, a church service. You don't get quite get as many people falling over but then again the the uh, performer generally doesn't give people that little push (laughs) yes indeed so we can see that uh definitely happening uh vance do you have a question yeah um i was wondering do you think there's something about the demon alcohol and you know the the prevalence of alcohol that that the jew um you know the jew houses and so forth and the association with the devil I'm not sure about anything specific, but certainly alcohol does allow you to um, lose your inhibitions. And um, don't forget that a lot of the early days of the development of this music was during the Prohibition era. So alcohol was a mission to get. But I don't know if there's any particular relation between the idea of spirits in that sense or that there was anything... um, sacred about the alcohol i mean there is that in the voodoo traditions but i don't have any evidence of that crossing over i mean i know that in new orleans alcohol is strongly used in those people who still take part in voodoo ceremonies but i don't know if that's associated with um a saturday night on bourbon street i don't think so i think they're kept very separate i think a lot of people in new orleans try and keep away from bourbon street on a saturday night (laughs) (laughs) it makes sense okay and um well, let's go back to religion. If the devil, obviously not just in the blues, but in early, in African, African-American folklore, he's a bit different. And I mean, again, he changes much because of the influence of some of these uh, traditional religions, folk religions that were brought over from Africa via slavery. So the, the figure of Satan he takes these characteristics of what these trickster spirits from africa that's right so um i mean the devil has always had an element of the trickster you see that sometimes in a lot of um european folk mythology Mm -hmm. but um he did get identified with some of the figures that were uh carried over syncretized from africa so the most famous one would be um papa legba um that's the one most people know um, he was a, a spirit of the Fon people that got adapted in both Haitian and um, New Orleans voodoo, where they're kind of different figures, even though they have the same name, but there's a strong, there are strong elements that are similar between them. Um, that idea of breaking bonds, breaking barriers, and being trickster figures who can be both a blessing and a curse, depending on how you encounter them. I often find when I'm talking to people about um, trickster figures, the best analogy I can think of that people would be familiar with is actually Br'er Rabbit. And those folk tales that we know of about Br'er Rabbit have 
strong associations with the same tales that were told about the devil, the devil going around, causing tricks, causing chaos, causing mischief, and maybe getting what he wants, but uh, getting egg on his face in the end as well. There, there's, a, <laughs> <laughs> there's a bit of the same. So you have stories about um, gamblers outwitting the devil, um, you know, selling the, oh, there's a story about selling the devil their soul, but uh, se- ending up selling the uh, devil the bottom of their foot, the bottom of their shoe. <laughs> Yeah, so the devil no, can trick, but he can be tricked. Yeah, yeah, that's the whole point. I think even in uh, in Faustus. Well, we'll talk about Faustus too, because that's part of your book. But I think it was, yeah, I think it was Gordon White. He talked about how the devil is really has three functions in Western history. One is obviously the font of evil, and he's just a sadist that wants to destroy the world. Yada yada. The other one is sort of the the Promethean figure. He's a rebel. And he brings wisdom to humanity and helps humanity, although he can be a trickster. And the other one, as we're talking about, he's sort of a a, a folk spirit. Uh, he he does stuff like steal your your cattle in the middle of the night, or turn off the lights, or try to take you uh, on a joy ride. I mean, in Portugal, when I was growing up, and in Mexico, there are thousands of devil stories. You know, he tricked his noble into falling over a cliff he seduced a maiden and it's just it's over it's almost like when i was a kid i'd be like god this guy's busy how does he get around every five seconds but this is what you might say that the devil in african-american culture he's more of the prometheus plus the folk spirit that's that's a really good way to put it um when i think sometimes people hear about robert johnson the devil and they think of something like um out of a dennis wheatley book but um, it's it, it is more um, more of a of a tricks of spirit, and like I said, you see that in the songs. Um, one of my favorite examples is uh, the musician Petey Wheatstraw. He was actually a piano player, um, although the only photo of him shows him holding a guitar for some reason. But he called himself the Devil's son-in-law, uh, the High Sheriff of Hell. And when you hear about him here, he calling himself the Devil's son-in-law, that sounds like he's <laughs> some sort of diabolical high priest. But what a just what it just means and sort of comes across in his song of that name is that um, he married the devil's daughter and he's in a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah, that's the figure. And I think you're, I think what story and please correct me if I'm wrong. You talk about, I think it's Jack and the devil and you write, despite his love for earthly things, the devil acts as a spiritual figure. He loves the blood and sweat of juke joints, whiskey houses and brothels, but his body's spiritual and his natural home is hell. So he's kind of a, yeah, he's an artist and a party animal that can probably hang out with musicians and teach them some of the tunes he forgot from heaven or brought from heaven, right? I'm getting William. (laughs) Oh, just like William Blake, energy is eternal delight. Ah, yes, yes, well said. (laughs) And you talk that, uh, you talk about a figure they call Stagger Lee, who could be a good uh, human archetype of the, the blues devil. Stagger Lee is a fascinating figure in African American folklore because he was a real person. He was a he was a gambler. We have newspaper articles of him uh, killing another person called Billy Lyons or Billy the wow. Lion. Um, but even before he died, there were blues songs about him. He entered into the folklore, and it became something much much bigger. I think most people might be familiar with his story um, through Nick Cave, his uh, album Murder Ballads, where he does a version of Stagger Lee, which is um, incredibly violent, but actually most of the lyrics that Nick Cave uh, sings of that come from um, what they call toasts, uh, rhyming stories that men would tell on the streets to try and amuse one another. You know, he walked through water, he walked through mud, he came to a place called the Bucket of Blood. He asked the bartender for something to eat, he gave him a dirty glass of water and a rotten piece of meat. And uh, a great performance of that can be seen in the movie Black Snake Moan, where... Um, Samuel L. Jackson plays a character called Lazarus, a very ominous name, who suffers right. his own resurrection performing that song in uh, Duke Joint. And it's a wonderful scene in that film, backed by um, Cedric Burnside on drums, the grandson of the great Cedric Burnside and uh, the great Hill Country guitarist Kenny Brown on guitar in that film. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's such a wonderful tradition. And, of course, you can go to uh, 
I mean, the most modern example would be uh, Charlie Daniels' band, The Devil Went Down to Georgia, which is a classic one. And Very much But so. even in the South, it's all over the place. It's wonderful. Of course, some people say, you know, summoning a band of demons should disqualify anyone from a fiddle contest. So Johnny <laughs> should have seen something, should have called it out from the start. <laughs> signed sign the, the fiddle contest waiver like in Futurama. <laughs> but, uh, where can people know more about you or find you on the internet? So I'll have it on the show notes, but for those of you listening on audio, Matt, where can they find out more about uh, you and your work? Um, well, I'm on Twitter. Uh, put my spell on you as my Twitter handle. I tend to keep my self hanging back a little bit on Twitter. I just mostly post news articles that I find show us what an interesting place the world is. My own website is uh, mattfrederick.info and that's where you can um, order a copy of the book. The book can be found um, at all the usual online places. I don't need to give them any more publicity than they <laughs> already have there. The, the, the big one is probably an archon itself. I think that's what oh, the A God, stands the for. The true devil. The true devil. <laughs> But of course, the book is available. It's distributed through um, distributed worldwide. So, if you just go up to your favorite local independent bookstore and ask for a meeting at the crossroads, Robert Johnson, the Devil by Matt Frederick, they'll be able to order a copy in. And uh, I can be heard every Sunday on uh, Melbourne Radio PBS one hundred six point seven FM. You can listen online at pbsfm.org.au. I tend not to talk too much during the show. I mostly just play music but if you want to get a bit of a taste of blues and that's a radio show is in my humble opinion a good place to do us wonderful well check it out i really enjoyed a meeting at the crossroads and i think the audience will too especially if you want to understand the uh the trickster the crossroads change art everything else and uh, as even as we recently talk at this conference gnosticism probably in its primordial ancient hebrew form was really about the trickster so um this stuff all ties in together and it definitely will work for the liberation of your mind and your soul so but we are at the end vance thanks for keeping us company oh sure it was interesting to learn about the history of all this music that i played occasionally in my younger days so uh thanks a lot matt Appreciate it. Yes, Matt. Thank you very much for coming on Aeon Byte. Uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you for your time and good luck with all your other projects. Well, thank you very much, Miguel and Vance. And uh, thank you also for picking up on those different elements of the book. I find everybody who reads this book gets something different out of it. Some people are interested in the right. historical aspects and the story of Robert Johnson. Others, like yourself, pick up those um, more esoteric elements, but they also tie together so no matter which angle you enter the story from you'll be able to take something new from it you'll do the right deal with the devil <laughs> <laughs> damn uh, straight there you go well thank you matt and uh we will talk soon catch you around and there you have it matt granting us some cool ass modern mythology and so much more in our second part, we'll go deeper into Stagger Lee, as well as the legend of John the Conqueror. We'll certainly get into voodoo and other traditions. Then we'll take a deep dive into the trickster archetype, with loads on, of course, Hermes. Matt will explain what exactly is the archetype or magical place that is the crossroads. It's found in so many traditions, you see. We'll circle back to the blues and discuss our favorite movies with Satan, just like we did with Carl, and much more. For the Fool's Devil Bargain, it's only $6.99 for AB Prime or $4.99 at Red Circle, or whatever you want to pledge on Patreon. If you find value in any of this content, please support. Your support can be in the form of some shekel donations to PayPal or the U.S. mail or whatever, and it really, really helps. There is also a link on the show notes if you want to donate via Stripe now. I also have the merch store and an Amazon wish list. Get your popular Not Today Archons t-shirt today. 
Finding Hermes is going strong, and so are our virtual Alexandria exclusive private meetings that include exercises loyal to the ancient Gnostics and a monthly intimate Q&A. If you want to understand and experience Gnosticism in its full impact and liberating secrets, become an official citizen of the virtual Alexandria. I've done presentations on the Sethians, the Gospel of Thomas, the secrets of the serpent Gnostics, Gnostic sex magic, and why we live in Gnostic times, and covered a lot of Gnostic sex and their rituals. Don't forget to my voiceover availability. I'll bring stellar voiceover with down-to-earth professionalism, no matter what project or scope you need. I'm also on Rockfin or Odyssey if crypto is your bag. If you need help with uh, all these choices, just message my ass. I'm always here to help, and I truly appreciate your help. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being yourself, your true self, here in the desert of the real. Hello and goodbye, as always. <laughs>